Hi, everyone. Welcome to week 10 of Scientist Chats. We have a very, very special episode for you today. It's very special chat. It's very, it's one of those topics that I've been interested in personally since I was a, a kid. So it's, it's going to be very interesting for me as well. Uh, before that, just a few of the guidelines as per usual. Attendees under the age of 13 should be supervised by a parent or guardian. As well as just to let everyone know that this session is being recorded. And just a bit of news, we have one more week of scientist chats before we go on a little break. It is next week, that's June 24th. So hope to see everyone there. And this week, our topic is on paleontology. Very interesting. So our guest today is Ashley Reynolds, who's a PhD candidate in ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Toronto and the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, Ashley's research is centered around the growth dynamics and ecology in living and extinct cats. So please join me in welcoming Ashley. Hello, everybody. Hope everybody is having a really excellent day. I'm just gonna pop up my screen. So, hello, everybody. Um, so as Adiza said, I'm Ashley, uh, and I am a vertebrate paleontologist. So as a paleontologist, I study animals and organisms that are extinct. Um, generally, we study fossils, so that basically means anything that's about 10,000 years old, all the way to hundreds of millions of years old. And as a vertebrate paleontology, I focus on things that have a backbone. So you and I, we all have a backbone. Fish have backbones, uh, frogs have backbones, and all mammals have backbones. So I'm sort of specifically focusing on all of those mammals. Um, and the reason why I really like paleontology is because to me, it's sort of, it's a puzzle. And I really like puzzles. Um, but paleontology is a sort of special kind of puzzle. Like all, all sciences are puzzle-like. You're always trying to fit one more piece into our understanding of how the world works. The sort of tricky thing about paleontology and the reason why I like it is because when we're dealing with stuff that's in the fossil record, um, we don't actually have all of our puzzle pieces. We're missing a few of them. So with a lot of the things we're looking at, but not all of them, all we have are bones um, or the hard parts that are preserved of them. So if all we have are bones, we can't go out and actually watch these animals in their natural environment. So if I was, you know, maybe studying lions today, like this lion here, you know, I would just be able to go out and watch them and, you know, maybe I could learn more about their everyday lives, what they like to eat, um, how they behave, um, who talks to who. So, you know, what is the social structure of a lion? But with something that's in the fossil record, I can't go out and look at them. So I have to come up with creative ways to think about how to answer those questions that we have about anything in the natural world, but in a way that doesn't require me to actually go out and look at them with like binoculars or a telephoto camera lens. And that's sort of what got me into paleontology. I actually, um, I wasn't always into paleontology. I liked dinosaurs and stuff as a kid. I think most kids do. Um, but I thought I was gonna go to school for fashion design. I actually applied to the fashion design program at Ryerson. Um, I didn't get in, <laughs> spoiler alert. Uh, and I went to U of T instead, so I, kind of spent a couple years figuring out what it was that I liked and it turned out that the courses that I really liked were the ones where I got to play with bones um, and the ones where I got to learn more about the natural world so what I ended up deciding is that that's what I wanted to do I wanted to look at bones and I wanted to learn more about my favorite group of animals which is cats so for my PhD oops, not working, there we go for my PhD uh, which is what I'm working on now, I started looking at a very special cat to me, and that's this cat here. It's called Smilodon. Smilodon is a saber-toothed cat. 
So what that means is that instead of having, you know, the nice sort of cone shape, ice cream cone shaped teeth that uh, cats today have, like a house cat that you might have in your house or a lion or a tiger, saber tooth cats have these really long fangs that are squished flat from side to side. And these act sort of like big steak knives in their mouths, which is really, really, really cool. So Smilodon is this special kind of saber tooth cat. It's one of many saber tooth cats. So we often um, think of the saber tooth cat as being the only saber tooth cat, but really there's a whole bunch of them. And saber cats sort of belong to this separate group of cats that's different from all of the cats that are alive today. So the saber tooth cats, none of them are still alive. Um, they're fully extinct. And what I want to understand is sort of why they're extinct and um, what makes them so different from living cats. So Smilodon in particular comes from this time in the past called the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene was from about two and a half million years ago to 12,000 years ago. Um, so quite a long time ago, but not as old as um, when the dinosaurs lived. And in sort of common day language, you'll probably hear the Pleistocene referred to as the Ice Age. And that's because there were all of these glaciers, these big sort of sheets of ice that were covering North America at the time. Now, Smilodon is probably the most famous of the saber-tooth cats. Um, and this is just because we have a lot of them. Um, they're really famously known from what are called the tar pits in Southern California. But even though we have a lot of them, there's still a lot of questions we have about how they lived. A lot of people like to debate about whether they lived in these sort of big prides, just like a lion does today, or if maybe they lived alone, which is what most cat species do today. So we have a lot of sort of conflicting opinions here. Um, some researchers will be like, yep, they were social. Others will be like, nope, absolutely not. They were definitely not social. Um, so sort of the, the crux of what I'm doing right now is trying to see if I can figure out whether or not they were social by looking at something called life history. And life history is an area of biology that deals with sort of the sequence of events that happens in the life of an organism. So we all go through these sequences, you know, at one point um, we were conceived, um, then we were born, then we start to grow up. So, you know, you started off as a little baby, uh, you grew taller, you started to get bigger. Um, I stopped growing when I was five feet tall. So some of us stop earlier than others um, and some go really late. So that's where we see these sort of differences in life history. So, you know, maybe some animals are growing longer than others. Maybe some are living longer than others. Uh, maybe for some, it takes longer for them to leave their mother. Um, maybe for some, it takes less time. And these are sort of the sequences that I think might be able to tell us about whether or not these fossils lived in social groups. There's this idea that if you live in a social group, you're probably gonna be stretching out a lot of these events. So if you live in a social group, you might stay with your group for longer. Um, you might take longer to grow just because there's less pressure to actually get to a size where you can take care of yourself very quickly. And this is something that happens with people. We actually stay with our parents for quite a bit longer um, than most mammals do. Um, but of course, as I was talking about earlier, I can't go out and watch Smilodon in the wild and I can't see this life history directly. So I have to come up with a creative way to do it. And the way that I do this is through something called bone histology. So histology means the study of tissues and a tissue is just any sort of part of your body. So a tissue can be skin, it can be a part of a liver. Um, it can be pretty much any part of your body. And histology is actually looking at those tissues on the microscopic level. So we take these tissues, we look at them under a microscope and see what we can see. Of course, bone histology is looking at the tissues that make up bone. And what's really cool about bone is that because it's this sort of mix 
of um, these cells that actually lay down the bone and this hard bone itself, um, when bone fossilizes, we can still see a lot of these structures. So we can still see the traces that were made when the bone was being created while the animal was alive. So the big thing here is that in bone, so in long bones, like um, a thigh bone or an arm bone, we get these growth marks that are formed. And these growth marks are put down just about once every year. So you can think of them a lot like tree rings. Tree rings will grow about once every year and you can use them to count how long that tree has been growing. So just in the same way we can use that for tree rings, we can count the number of growth marks on a bone and tell how big or how long the animal was alive for. And there are a little bit of complications here. Um, you can see in this picture, there's like these little donut shapes. And those are, sorry, nope, my, cute, my uh, mouse doesn't show up over there. Anyways, you can see all these little donut shapes and you can actually see them behind me on, uh, on my uh, virtual background here. And those actually sort of cover up all of these growth marks as the animal gets older. Um, so we have to do a little bit of detective work in order to count the true age. So this sort of starts, of course, by making our histo histological thin section is what like, we call them. So you take a bone, you slice it down the middle thereabouts, and then you have to grind it really, really, really thin. So we have a whole bunch of specialized equipment in our lab that helps us make sure that these are so thin that light is actually going to pass through them. So what we'll do is we'll put a thin section sort of on a microscope, the light comes from the bottom, and as it shines through, it's actually illuminating all of those structures that we're looking for. So here you can see this sort of process and sequence, and the picture on the right, you can see those lines that I've drawn. I've drawn those afterwards, those are not in the bone themselves, or at least they're not that visible in the bone itself, I should say. Um, and those are those growth marks that we're looking for. So you can see from this, there's only two growth marks. So this animal was probably not very old. And there's a number of other clues that tell us that it wasn't very old. Um, you can see that all of the holes in the bone are quite big. So you can see a lot of holes where you can see through. That means that this bone was probably still being developed. And that means that this animal was still growing really, really, really fast. So it was at least two years old and it was still growing pretty fast. That's a long time for most mammals. So what we do is we take all these lines that we've sort of traced and we can do that for a number of specimens. So we can take a whole bunch of them and then we can put them together to sort of look at how growth happens across multiple individuals. When we put that, that together, we get this special thing called a growth curve. And I know that this is, I promise this is the only graph I'm gonna show you. But essentially what this shows you is on the bottom, you're seeing how old the animal is. So you start at birth at age zero and sort of on the left side, you're seeing how big the animal is. So of course, as the animal gets older, it gets bigger. But you can see that at a certain point, the size stops getting bigger. And what's important here is that if you're looking at the lion and tiger, which are the ones in blue, versus a smilodon, which are the ones in red, orange, and green, you can see that smilodon is getting bigger than either a lion or a tiger. So it's going higher up on that sort of vertical axis. But they're also taking longer to hit that sort of point where they stop growing altogether. So what this is, is essentially the growth is taking a longer time to sort of stop growing. So you can think of that sort of like, I stopped growing when I was 11, and that's why I'm really short. <laughs> but, you know, maybe someone else stopped growing when they were 16, and they're six feet tall. So that's sort of what's happening here. Now, this is sort of only the first step. Right now, I'm only comparing to a lion and a tiger. And we do know that lions take a little bit longer to grow than tigers. And this might be because they live in these big social groups. We don't know if that's a pattern that we see across many animals. 
So the next thing that I'm doing is comparing with other close relatives of cats. So cats belong to this group of mammals that we call Filiformia, which essentially just means they're cat shaped. So somebody looked at mostly their skulls and their teeth and were like, ah, these look like cat skulls. Um, and this includes a whole bunch of different animals from hyenas, like the spotted hyena, which I know looks a little bit more like a dog on the outside, but I promise you they're more closely related to cats. It includes things like this bear cat, uh, which is the one you see on the top right, uh, mongooses and meerkats, and these things called civets. And if we look at the sort of broader group, some of them are social and some of them are not social. So what I'm doing is sort of like the second part of my research is um, looking at all of these and seeing if there are patterns, like if all of the social ones tend to grow a little bit slower than all of the ones that live by themselves, um, and try to take that information and then apply it to what I'm seeing in um, the Smilodon. And then just to sort of take things in a different direction, because most of what I've been talking about right now has nothing to do with Canada, but I feel very connected to um, to my home, to Canada. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some of my work actually finding some of these cool carnivores in Canada. Um, so what you see here, this is a photo of me holding a very special fossil to me. Um, it doesn't look like much, but this is actually one of the finger bones from Smilodon. Um, and it came from these deposits in Alberta, so in Medicine Hat, Alberta. Um, and I described this specimen as well as some other cat specimens, all from the Pleistocene, so all from the Ice Age, uh, last year. And this is the only specimen that we have of Smilodon from anywhere in Canada. So before we verified that this is what this was, um, we didn't know that we actually had this really incredible animal here in Canada as well. It makes sense that it would be here, but we just didn't have the evidence for it yet. And we're also now finding that we're getting other really cool prehistoric animals in Canada as well. So this one here, this is the lower jaw, so sort of the bottom jaw right here, of this special kind of wolf called the dire wolf. And a dire wolf is sort of like living wolves, but they're kind of, they're more beefy. It's like if a living wolf worked out a lot. Um, <laughs> so we have these really interesting ideas that we probably have these, these really cool Ice Age mammals here in Canada as well. Um, and what we need to know is sort of how they got here. We, we kind of have this, this thought that um, a lot of Canada was covered by these glaciers, by the ice sheets, when, um, when um, the Ice Age was occurring. So, you know, under what conditions could they actually be here? There were probably only particular spots that were relatively ice free that we could actually find them in. And they might have only been able to be here during sort of these, um, these times when the, the cold and the ice wasn't quite as bad. Um, so what I've been doing for the last couple of years is very slowly starting to do my own field work, looking at the Ice Age mammals of Alberta. So Alberta is really, really, really famous for dinosaur fossils. And I've gone out with my supervisor. So you can see my supervisor, David, there um, in the blue hat. Um, and I've gone with him to dig up dinosaurs before. Um, but this whole time, there were all of these things that I personally am more interested in, all of the mammals sort of sitting above all of the places that we were finding dinosaurs. So the last couple of years, I've been very lucky to go out and start looking for more of these Ice Age mammals um, and start looking for clues that will help us figure out sort of how long they were there for, um, if there were sort of patterns of them having to come and go because of the ice. Um, so that sort of work is where I'm looking to in the future in addition to looking at more cats because cats are the best. Um, so yeah, that's it for me. And if anybody has any questions, I'd be really happy to answer them. There we go. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for that presentation. So, uh, so the chat will now be, oh, do we have any questions? No, not yet. So I have a, a few, just a simple uh, question about what, what's the difference between paleontology and archeology? span 
very good question. Um, so paleontology usually deals with anything that's not human. And archaeology is looking at sort of the um, the record of ancient human civilizations. So there does get to be a little bit of a gray area there, especially in, um, in sort of the time period that I'm looking at. So during the Ice Age, you do get a lot of interactions between ancient humans and the animals that they lived with. So while I consider myself a paleontologist, um, other people might actually be working on very similar things, but consider themselves zoo archaeologists. So a zoo archaeologist is somebody that works on the animal remains that are associated with human remains. Um, so sort of the key difference there is that I'm not focusing on anything that's sort of related to human deposits. Um, you never know, there could be human deposits in the same places that I'm looking for the animals that I'm interested in. Um, whereas a zoo archaeologist is probably like, ah, I found this cool cat while also digging up humans. <laughs> um, there is a little bit of a gray area as to when archaeology, specifically focusing on humans, becomes paleontology. Because of course humans have evolved from apes. Um, or we are apes. So there is definitely some question as to at what point you're in the archaeology territory and at what point you're in the paleontology territory. And I think a lot of that kind of comes down to personal choice, although generally it's sort of if you're dealing with homo sapiens, so the species that we belong to, then you're definitely in archaeology. Um, some people who study archaeology may study Neanderthals, which are a little bit more different. Um, but um, it's sort of a, it gets a little bit hazier there, I guess. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, so I have a question. We have some questions coming from the chat right now. So you just showed a, the a little clip of the little image of the movie Ice Age. Yeah. So one of the questions is, who's, who's your favorite character from Ice Age? So I haven't watched Ice Age in a really long time, which I probably <laughs> should, should, have, should watch it more. Um, I mean, I guess if I'm being really biased to Diego, because he is a saber tooth cat. Okay. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I think I have to say Diego. Okay. I know it's not a very exciting answer. <laughs> uh, that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good one. So keep, keeping with the saber tooth cat, how, how did the um, Smilodon get its name? Ooh, um, this is a story I really like. Um, <laughs> so Smilodon means knife tooth. So essentially when the first Smilodon was discovered, they saw that it had these really big steak knife-like teeth, and they were like, all right, we'll just name it that. Um, now, what's really cool is that, of course, there are several species of Smilodon. Um, so Smilodon is the genus name, so there's, there's three different types of Smilodon. The one that I work on is called Smilodon fatalis, um, and that means fatal knife tooth, so it's like extra cool. Okay. Um, but what's sort of more interesting is that it it didn't it wasn't actually always called Smilodon fatalis uh, when it was first described. Somebody called it Trusophilus fatalis, um, but then they later figured out that these belonged to the same sort of group of animals. Um, and we have this sort of convention and naming where whoever names something first, the oldest name gets priority. So Smilodon is a name that's older than Trusophilus. So now all of those closely related animals are called Smilodon. Okay. So I have another question here. Uh, were there ever, how many ice ages were there? If you, do you know that? Or were there more than one? So that's a very good question. I guess it kind of depends on how you define an ice age. So within an ice age, um, or at least within the most recent ice age, um, you get these sort of ebbs and flows of the ice. So, um, you know, the ice will kind of expand and it'll contract and it'll expand and it'll contract, but it's still kind of considered the same ice age. It's just that you have different levels of iciness um, during that time. Uh, that said, there were times way back in the past where we did also have um, a lot of glaciation or a lot of ice development in the world. So um, way, way, way back, there's this phenomenon that you might have heard of called snowball earth. Um, 
And that is thought of sort of as another ice age, even bigger than the one that um, existed during the Pleistocene. Um, and some would actually argue that we're still in an ice age. Um, we're just in a long interglacial period. So we're in a long, relatively warm period of the ice age. Um, we don't really know yet <laughs> if we're, you know, if we're going to go back to how cold it was maybe 35,000 years ago. Um, but we're definitely sort of still in a relatively cold period of Earth's history. Okay. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, so I have a few more questions about the Smilodon, uh, about its life history. So how long do you think the Smilodon could live and what did they eat? Both very good questions. Um, so how long did Smilodon live? The oldest um, that I have a record of right now is about 13. Oh. Um, which would make sense. Um, I would say probably the longest they would live would be in the 20s. That's about how long big cats today can live to be. Um, and of course, the tricky thing with knowing how long something lives, you have to cut up a lot of them <laughs> okay. in order to uh, sort of figure out what the maximum life it, lifespan is. Um, it also sort of depends on what place you're getting these specimens from. So right now, I'm not focused as much on how long they lived. Um, it's sort of more at what point did they get to sort of maximum size, just because that's a little bit easier to understand um, without being like, I have made thin sections of every single Smilodon in existence. <laughs> oh. I haven't actually, but <laughs> I okay. was saying I would have to in order to be able to tell yeah, how yeah. long they lived, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then the second part was what did they eat, right? Yeah. Yeah, so um, there's this really cool research that I haven't done personally, but that um, other Smilodon researchers have, where they look at um, the ratios of different isotopes in Smilodon. So different elements have, um, so like carbon, for example, you'll have little carbon molecules, some of which are a little bit heavier than other ones. Um, and this is because they have um, different numbers of the particles that make up carbon. And because they're slightly different in weight, um, they're processed by the body slightly differently. And we can look at the ratios of the heavy to the light elements um, and figure out, you know, based on looking at things that are potential prey, um, what that animal might have eaten. So what we found using this type of analysis is that Smilodon has these isotope ratios that are very similar to a lot of sort of large herbivores that were very plentiful at the time. So things like horses, um, some of the smaller giant ground sloths. Um, so there used to be some really, really, really big giant ground sloths, but there are some that are a little bit more manageable in size and Smilodon probably would have eaten them um, and probably would have eaten the young of some of those. Also some of Smilodon's close relatives have been found um, with the remains of young mammoths and mastodons that they probably ate. So it's likely that Smilodon would have been able to eat those as well. Okay. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned that there have been some large uh, animals, like the larger ground sloths. So one of the questions you're actually asking, why are there so many large animals in the Pleistocene area? Mm. Um, time period. Very good question. Um, so this is something that's sort of um, actively being researched. So I guess less the question of why are there so many big animals in the Pleistocene as why are there not so many big animals now? So we do find that, um, you know, so let's say after the dinosaurs went extinct or the, the non-bird dinosaurs, I should say, um, we find that mammals started really, really small, but then they rapidly get pretty big. And once they get pretty big, you'll find that there's a lot of really big mammals that sort of, you know, existed for maybe the last 50 million years. Um, and the exact mammals that were really big are different, but you'll find a lot of mammals that are about the same size sort of throughout. And then what happens at the end of the Pleistocene is we all of a sudden see that, especially in places like North America and Europe, 
all of the really big mammals or most of the really big mammals all go extinct at once. And there's a few reasons why that might be. It could be because climate was changing pretty quickly. So we were going from this relative cool period to a slightly warmer period. And it could also be because humans were starting to move around the world. And they might have been hunting mammals um, to extinction uh, and sort of out competing the predators that would have hunted the same mammals. Now, we don't have an answer yet as to which one of those causes is sort of the predominant one. It depends a little bit on where you are in the world. Um, so in islands like Australia or Madagascar, we have pretty good evidence that humans are the main cause. In other places, it may be a combination of humans and climate change, or it may be different for different species. So some species may have been more susceptible to the changing climate, whereas others may have been more susceptible to the hunting or a competition from humans. Okay. Uh, so with the, um, what sort of climates did the uh, Smilodons live in? Um, a little bit sort of like a grassland. So if you think of um, the prairies today, they probably lived in a lot of those areas. It seemed like they liked areas um, where there was a lot of grass, so relatively open areas, but enough cover for them to be able to stalk their prey. So Smilodon is not as well developed for running as some other saber-toothed cats are or as um, some living cats are. They're very similar in proportion to a jaguar, and jaguars live in sort of more heavily covered areas. Now with Smilodon, we don't think that necessarily meant that they were living in these sort of like dense forests, um, just because of other evidence that we found with them. Things like horses don't generally live in dense forests, and we find a lot of horses where we find Smilodon. Um, in this case, they're probably that big and stocky because they required all of that power to bring down their very big prey. Um, but some of the, the things that we found in association like pollen or, um, or again, these isotopes suggest that they were probably um, living in sort of these mixed areas. So sort of grasslands with a little bit of forest cover. <laughs> So, so if, if they were built the way you described them, what, what, what is the need for the, for the massive teeth? Ah, so I guess it's, um, it's sort of more of a question of um, which came first. Oh. So it turns out that you get this sort of very, um, this evolution of these massive teeth right along with this change in proportions. Um, so it's thought that those massive teeth are the main things that help you kill your prey. Um, so if you think of having a steak knife, it cuts a lot more effectively than a butter knife does or an ice cream cone would. So the way that living cats hunt, or living big cats, I should say, um, is that they usually don't actually cut into their prey at all. Um, they'll sort of grab on to something like a throat um, and they usually wait for the animal to suffocate because it can't breathe. Now with something like a big steak knife, what you're probably going to be doing is you're probably going to be kind of taking a really big bite uh, and causing potentially suffocation because you're cutting into the airway, um, but also a lot of bleeding. And as we all know, bleeding is not very good and we don't want to do it um, because you can die if you bleed too much. So it's thought that these big teeth were probably um, made to, to sort of cause this really huge damage to the animals um, that would have made them die very quickly. Now, of course, if you have these long flat teeth, they're actually much more prone to breaking than the teeth in living cats. Um, they're sort of, um, because they're flat from side to side, if they get snapped to the side, they kind of just snap. Mm -hmm. So that's where those really big and strong proportions come in. Because if you're going to use those really fragile teeth, you want to make sure that your prey is not struggling too much. So they're not going to snap your teeth. Um, and those really strong forelimbs will help you kind of hold them down and make sure they're not moving. 
Well, so would you say with that, so one of the questions actually asked here, so is are smile limbs built to pounce or jump really high? Or are they built more to wrestle? Um, probably built a little bit more to wrestle. I say they probably are able to jump pretty well. Not necessarily any better or worse than most cats of similar size. Um, usually the bigger you get, the harder it is to sort of like get as much air <laughs> on a jump. Um, so smiling on its back legs, which would be what power a jump, are relatively similar or more similar to what we would see in a living cat than their forelegs are. Um, so they're probably about the same as like a lion or a tiger. Um, but we do know from some of the injuries that we found in Fossil Smilodon um, that a lot of the injuries we find are probably from wrestling with prey because they were probably grabbing onto them and then if the prey is struggling you get a lot of um, a lot of pressure that's put on the spine so we find a lot of injuries in the spine of Smilodon and that suggests that they were doing a lot of that wrestling. Okay uh, so I have a question here about uh, does the fossil record in Alberta, in the Alberta province, uh, provide evidence that the Smilodon arrived to North America via Beringia? Hmm. It's a very good question. Um, so it doesn't provide evidence that Smilodon came from Beringia. Um, so Beringia, for anybody who might not have heard of it before, is essentially this big land bridge that connected um, Eastern Asia with the sort of um, western or northwestern tip of North America. So back during the Ice Age, there was this big land bridge that animals could cross from Asia to North America. Um, and we do know that Smilodon was already in North America before the species that I looked at existed. Um, so the sort of ancestor to Smilodon fatalis, the one that I work on, and the one that I found in Alberta is called Smilodon gracilis, and it's most commonly found in southern North America. So it probably evolved there. So we had all of these saber-toothed cats in North America for quite a long time before Smilodon existed. But Alberta might be able to provide evidence that some of the species of other cats that we know may have been coming into North America from Beringia. So in, in North America, we also had two species of lion. So we had the American lion, which is the one that's found at the La Brea Tar Pits in Los Angeles. And it was a really, really big cat. It was even bigger than Smilodon, so it was like twice the size of a living lion. They were huge. But we also had in Eurasia um, what's called a cave lion. And the cave lion is found in places like Alaska and the Yukon Territory. Now, we have some evidence, but not conclusive evidence, that we might have found cave lions in Alberta as well. So if we were finding cave lions in Alberta, those were probably coming over from Beringia, and they were probably coming down this little corridor where there was no ice, sort of right through the center of Alberta. Um, I don't know yet if that was definitely the case. All we have is a bone where it looks a little bit more similar to a cave lion, but we don't know if that's just because different individuals look a little bit different or if it's actually because the two species look different. So we still need to do more research there, but it's possible that some animals were actually coming down through there. Okay. So um, the, just to get it uh, correct, so Beringia is that Bering land bridge, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. That, okay. I, yeah, I, I, there's I, I a Bering land bridge. Yeah. yeah, and then the area we call Beringia. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Th thank you for that question. <laughs> like, yeah, it was that, a very that, good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so I have another question here about whether the uh, 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 smile of them would have camouflaged in tall grasses and what color were they? Also a very good question. So we don't actually know what color they were because we don't have any that are preserved with fur. Um, we can make some guesses about what color they might have been based on the colors we see in other cats. Um, so most cats that are alive today are either spotted or striped. Um, of course, there are some exceptions to this. So cougars and lions, uh, when they're adults, they're sort of just this brownish color. 
Um, so it's possible, and most of the the sort of illustrations you'll see of Smilodon usually have it with a lion-like color. Um, so sort of this monotone sort of brown color. But the truth is we don't actually know that. Um, from some of the environment data that we do have, um, it's possibly more likely that they would have been spotted or striped um, just because they would have wanted to use that for camouflage. Um, maybe not as sort of heavily spotted as like a jaguar or a leopard, um, but some degree of spotting. The truth is we don't really have a good grasp on sort of um, the reasons why there are all these different patterns and how they relate to the environment. Um, and we also don't really know enough about the environment that Smilodon lived in to be able to say. Um, it's also possible that Smilodon lived in a whole bunch of different environments. Um, we can't rule that out. A lot of cats do that as well. Um, so the truth is we don't know. So that's one of the fun things that when we get our friends who are paleo artists to reconstruct these animals for us, that's where they get to really sort of um, do things that they find interesting, but within sort of the realms of reality. Okay. So a lot, of, so is, is it that, it's, it's not that they're taking artistic liberties, just what we, they're doing it based on the best scientific yeah. knowledge that we have at the time, okay. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, when I was, I have been working with a friend who is, is doing a reconstruction for an upcoming paper and, um, you know, essentially what I told her was what I just told you. Like, I think actually the most likely are probably going to be some sort of spot or stripe, um, but not as extreme as like a clouded leopard or a jaguar. So I'm giving these sort of restrictions that make it as scientifically accurate as I can make it. But then, you know, within that, because we don't know, it's a place where you can have a little bit of fun with it. Okay. Very, very interesting. Uh, so we have a few more questions here. Uh, let me see if I can ask them. So you mentioned one of the reasons like the, some of the cats have like thicker bones is because of their age. Is it is it usually okay bigger cats that would have beefier bones? Because based on the way the person asked the question, bigger cats would have beefier bones or would you see, okay, if something is older would tend to have those larger, denser bones? That's a very good question. Um, so what happens is you'll get these bones will sort of grow bigger. So like if it starts really small like this, it'll kind of go to a certain point. And then while the animal gets older, at least with, with mammals, um, you'll get these sort of rings will get deposited, but they won't put a lot of circumference on it. Um, so this creates this sort of area on the edge of the bone, um, which is, you can call an outer circumferential layer. So it's this layer where you have all of these growth marks that are all squished together on the edge of the bone. Um, so in that case, the animal's not really getting any wider in its bones. What's interesting is that while many animals, um, the inside of the bone will also sort of get bigger. With Smilodon, I have some evidence, but I don't know for sure yet, that suggests that that sort of, um, that hollow area in the middle of the bone. It's called a medullary cavity. It looks like it might actually get smaller as Smilodon gets older. So that might be a way for it to sort of help strengthen its bones without um, sort of making them so wide that they don't really perform well for what they're really designed to do, which is to hold up the body. Um, now that's sort of early days. I don't know the, the real answer to that yet. That's just something that I've noticed in the specimens that I've worked on. Okay. And uh, so since, because your work is based, you, you do a lot of work at the ROM, correct? Yeah. Is, is it that way? That's where your lab is? Yes. Okay. So because of that and because of what's happening with quarantine and coronavirus and all that, how has that affected your type of research where you need to physically be there looking at samples? Yeah, I mean, it's it's affected it quite a bit. Um, so right now, what I'm working on is I'm working more on um, what I was talking about at the sort of end of my presentation. So doing that work of looking at what other close relatives of cats are doing. So I'm lucky enough that all of the data I needed for that, all of the information I needed, um, or most of it, I should say, not all of it, 
I already had um, before we started quarantine. So right now I have to sort of focus on that one piece of information. I'm not really working on my histology work right now um, because I still had a lot of thin sections that I had to make. Um, there is some work that I can do. So I do have some images that I have available to me. Um, so I can do things like, you know, tracing those growth marks to see how big they are. Um, and then I'm also working on um, publishing some of the papers that I maybe haven't had a chance to work on. Um, so right now I'm working on a paper about smiling on from Ecuador and um, working on that sort of that dire wolf that I showed you, um, working on it with um, a good friend in Lamy Italia who's helping me um, make that project more cool and sciencey. And uh, one final question: How how did you get? And I, I know you spoke a little bit of how you get, how you got into that type of work, but I want you to just elaborate a bit more. How did you really get into it? And how would you advise someone who's interested in this type of work? What what steps to take on average to get into that type of paleontology that you do? Yeah. So for paleontology specifically, um, paleontology is sort of a cool um, union of two disciplines. So it's biology plus geology, because a lot of what we're working with um, in the fossil record, they're all found in rocks. And we get a lot of information about where the animals we study come from, from the rocks that they're actually buried in. Um, so what I did was when I was in university, um, once I sort of figured out that this is what I wanted to do, which I didn't know right away, um, <laughs> I started taking courses that were both biology related and talked about all of the diversity of life that we have um, here on earth, as well as some geology courses, just to get a little bit of an understanding about, you know, how earth works, how it, how it moves, things like that. Um, we do get people who come to paleontology from, from different areas. Um, some people are much more biology focused which I was, whereas other people were much more geology focused and it sort of depends on the school that you go to. Um, so some schools, if they have a paleontology program, which not all do, um, the paleontology program is usually either in the biology department or it's in the geology department. Um, so usually it's sort of what you're most trained in depends on where you're going. Here at U of T, um, I'm getting my degree in ecology and evolutionary biology, so I'm much more biology focused. Now, for sort of any science degree, any science, like even if you don't want to be a researcher, basically any sort of area in science, um, of course the, the things to focus on or whatever type of science you're interested in, whether it's chemistry, physics, or biology, um, more and more even in paleontology, we are doing math. And I, you know, math wasn't my favorite thing. I find it very interesting to think about how um, the math that you're learning can help you answer questions that you're interested in. Um, because I, yeah, I didn't really like math until I started applying them to the questions, but until I figured out that I can use it to answer these questions I had about the natural world. Um, and then if, you know, doing something like research is something that someone's interested in. I actually do recommend um, sort of learning how to how to write um, and making sure to actively write. Um, one thing we don't talk about is that one of the biggest parts of what we do is sharing our research either with the public like I'm doing right now, so with, you know, everybody, um, but also just with um, other scientists. And that means that we actually do have to do a lot of writing. Um, so sort of working on those writing skills can really help. Um, and you, that doesn't even need to be science writing. Creative writing helps a lot. It helps you learn sort of the ways to, um, to make sentences sound good <laughs> um, and things like that. So those are sort of the things that I would focus on, but mostly just always make sure that you're doing something that you find fun. Um, and don't always restrict yourself to just those things. Um, I think more and more we're seeing that scientists are becoming well-rounded and we're um, 
trying to learn things about history and uh, sociology and stuff like that. So, yeah, I guess my uh, <laughs> my terrible answer is do everything, um, but mostly it's just stay curious and just yeah, stay curious and ask always ask questions about the world around you. That's a that's a very good answer. <laughs> I, I like how you emphasize on the writing and math because <laughs> I think people take those skills for granted sometimes. Like, yeah. Oh, oh what, 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 am, what am I going to use math for? Math is yeah. everywhere. <laughs> and I think a lot of the time we, um, we sort of, I don't want to say forget, but it can be hard when you're learning math because you learn it in a very technical way. Um, it's hard to learn about the applications. So it was definitely something that I did um, when I was younger is I sort of slacked off on math or didn't like it as much um, because I didn't see the way that it would be sort of helpful or the way that it could help me learn about other things. Um, so yeah. Nice. Okay, I have, I mean, let's go, I have one more question. This is yeah, a yeah. question for myself. Uh, so I don't know if you grew, grew up watching Power Rangers, they would say Sabertooth Tiger, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so the correct name is a Sabertooth Cat, it's not a Sabertooth Tiger. Yeah, so I mean, whatever words you use to help you get across what you mean is fine. The reason why I say Sabertooth Cat is because of what I was talking about earlier where um, Sabertooth Cats are all sort of in this different group of cats from from living ones. So when we say saber-toothed tiger, some people think that it's cl very closely related to a tiger, but a saber-toothed cat like Smile It On is um, just as closely related to a tiger as it is to a house cat. Um, so that's why I prefer to say saber-toothed cat. I have no problems with other people saying saber-toothed tiger. I know that that's sort of um, the most common way to say it. Um, but I just feel like because I work on them, I want to be a little bit more precise in the words that I use. Okay, perfect. Uh, do you have any final words for everyone listening here today? Um, I just, I want to say thank you all for coming. This is very, very, very fun. Thank you for all of your great questions. Um, I really enjoyed answering them. and. Make sure that you're always staying curious and always learning more about the natural world. Perfect. With that, thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you, thank you very much, Ashley. Oh, no problem. <laughs>